Psychological Foundations and Digital Technology, AEDT 1170U, Module 4, Video Clip 4.3. Today we'll be looking at the emotional factors and online learning. Now that you're aware of the major theorists in personality development and emotions, I'm going to challenge you to see how this affects you in an online environment. Each of us brings a personality to the digital world and the emotions we feel vary between individuals and also within the individual. Given the same situation, each person reacts differently. And it is often our reaction to this which either causes us stress or creates a positive or negative learning situation. Here are the guiding questions for today. What are the influences of emotion in online learning settings according to Riley, gallagher Lepak, and Killian? Based on the themes they found, reflect on where you stand for each emotion continuum. Using Jungian Myers-Briggs personality inventory indicators, try to predict what type of learner you are. In the article, Me and My Computer, Emotional Factors in Online Learning, the authors refer to the fact that cognition and affect, or emotion, are both important factors in our learning. This separation of heart and mind, of affect emotion and intellect logic, has existed for centuries. Let's think back to our definitions of these terms from previous video clips. Intelligence was the mental abilities needed to select, adapt to, and shape environments. So that involves our ability to learn from experience, to reason and solve problems, and to meet the challenges and, and goals in front of us. Cognition referred to the mental activities involved in thinking, knowing, remembering, and communicating. An emotion or affect was a response of the whole organism, including physical response, expressive behaviors, and conscious experience. Reflect on this. Which one of these is more important to you in an online learning setting? Emotion or cognition? In Western cultures, we tend to favor logical scientific thought and cognition. However, this is merely a cultural bias. In fact, research has shown that the interdependence of learning and emotion is far more complex than we previously thought. Imagine you could time travel back to your most successful learning situations. What emotions were you feeling and how did it affect your learning? How is that different than the emotions you felt when you were not as successful? What factors in your environment helped to create this positive vibe and what things were the negative influences? Remember that we each react differently, so when you share these experiences in tutorial, understand that what you felt was positive might have been just the opposite for another student. And as we learned in our work on emotions, there are some cross-cultural similarities, such as facial expressions and body language. We tend to perceive anger, sadness, fear, happiness, or surprise in the same way, regardless of the language we speak. Think of the ways that you show these emotions in text speak. Recognizing these emotions in teacher or peers can help us to engineer a more positive learning environment and to read when things are going poorly and correct our course. What features of online learning create positive emotions for you? And what are the features that frustrate you? How can you read the emotions of your peers and teachers in an online environment? Riley and other authors found that students' reactions to online learning came in five general themes, and these are the themes. First of all, aloneness, a sense of physical aloneness or the uncertainty of learning independently versus feeling powerful learning independently, uh, having a lack of connection to others online, and sort of that isolation feeling. The second one was anonymity or the degree of sharing identity or personal factors, such as feeling unrecognizable or invisible online. The third one, nonverbal communication, referred to the absence of face-to-face -face communication cues, so no visible body language made people a little uncomfortable when they were communicating online. And for other people, they actually felt safer because they um, were not being judged for their body language. Trepidation or fear, this would be fear of making mistakes, fear due to lack of online experiences or lack of experience with the technology, uh, or apprehension due to inexperience and also some concerns about privacy. And the last one were just general unknowns, ambiguity, not being face to face with your instructor or anything that was unclear that you couldn't get um, figured out online. 
Brainstorm some of the factors that you can relate to in these five themes and be prepared to share them in tutorial. If we can identify the struggles that you're having um, and also the positive features that you have, then we will move forward as a community. It's clear that online learning does have its challenges and its benefits and your responsibility is to identify the challenges that you face and share them with our online community. Affective or emotional dimensions of learning are extremely important. So take a look at the words below as cue words to see if you can identify with what your predominant emotions are. Are your emotions attributed to the learning environment or to the fact that you're learning independently? Is some of your emotional makeup related to what's occurring in your personal life or the physical space you're in while you're focused or distracted, you're comfortable or uncomfortable? And how can you separate your emotions from your learning, or should you? What are some of the ways that we, as an online community, can use technology to overcome the affective or emotional challenges in digital learning? Well, first of all, you can use social media to stay in touch with your classmates. Create some out-of-class blogs or wikis. Use your digital moment each week to let us know how you're feeling about the course. Remember, this is what you're going to submit as a photo or a word or a clip. This is how we can stay in touch. Don't isolate yourself. Reach out for help before you need it. And offer help to others if you have expertise in a certain area. Take responsibility for your role in our online community. Sometimes what happens is that the lines between teacher and student blur and we teach each other our, where our areas of strength are, in particular with regards to the technology. So don't be surprised if I will be asking you some questions. Now let's take a look at personality on online learning. According to Rove and Grooms, there are certain personality attributes that they suggest might be predictors of success in online learning. They used the Myers-Briggs personality indicators based on Young's theory of personality types. And Young had theorized that everybody has a basic orientation to the world that suggests the direction in which our energies or interests flow. For example, extroverts are drawn to the external world of people and events. Introverts are more drawn to the world of ideas. Sensors process the world through immediate and practical experiences and people who depend on intuition process the world through inspiration and imagination. People who tend to focus on thinking make decisions based on logical and impersonal analysis versus those of us focusing on feeling who make decisions based on personal values and heartfelt feelings. Judges tend to lead a structured, planned, and ordered existence. They, they're the list makers, they try to control, and they need decision and completion and perceivers are those of us who are spontaneous and value flexibility. Each of these types exists on a continuum, so take a moment to reflect on where you might sit on each of these continuums. Atman reported that people who tend to have success in distance courses uh, usually are extroverts, intuitives, thinkers, and judgers. Since traditional face-to-face -face school environments tend to be highly structured and organized, judgers are usually high achievers there, whereas perceivers don't like strong structures, can really do well in, in um, better in an online environment. Remember that that was only one study, however, and individual diversity plays a huge role. In addition, the teacher's or facilitator's ability to reach each learning style and personality type is probably more of a feature in you staying interested in the course than what type you actually are. The Toronto Star on July 21, 2012 featured an article on smartphones that can read you like a book. Technology would let your device sense your emotions. And I'm going to read a short clip from the article. Sick and tired of telling your friends how you feel? Don't worry. Your smartphone will soon be able to do it for you. Blackberry Maker Research in Motion has filed a patent for a smartphone that will be able to sense a user's emotional state based on the words being typed, your blood pressure, facial expressions, and even how hard you're tapping the keys. The goal, says the patent application, which was made public Thursday, is to eliminate the need for typing out all those smiley faces and frowns. Emoticons are so 2011. Galvanic skin response sensors may be used to capture biometric data of a user of the mobile device, including blood pressure, heart rate, muscle control, shaking, facial expressions, galvanic skin response, etc., that may be useful in determining the emotional state of the user, reads an excerpt from the U.S. patent application. 
In other words, the phone would read your emotions and add appropriate visual cues, say, like this if you're angry, in capital letters. While the availability of emoticons provides a way of expressing a writer's mood or temperament with regard to entered text, the use of emoticons detracts from the fluidity and spontaneity of the communication. Moreover, the desired emotion to be conveyed may not be available from the predefined set of available emoticons. If you find the idea of a mood-reading phone a little bit disturbing, tech industry watchers would beg to differ. Think of how many cues we give when we are communicating. Machines are pretty bad at interpreting them. This is a step toward addressing that, said Roel Vertigal, Associate Professor of Human-Computer Interaction at Queen's University in Kingston. With most smartphones having similar physical features and growing similarity in their operating systems, Things that might seem a little off the wall are a way to stand out from the crowd, said Duncan Stewart, Tech Research Director for Delwatt Canada. Smartphones look pretty much the same, broadly speaking, and do a lot of the same things. This is a way they can differentiate themselves, said Stewart, who estimates RIM could have the mood-reading phone on the market within a year. Earlier this year, Microsoft filed a patent application for systems to track web surfers' emotions based on video conversations, Facebook status updates, and other tools. The goal of Microsoft's technology is matching online ads to user moods. This is certainly something for us all to think about and chat about in tutorial. Here are the synthesis questions for today. What type of personality do you think our culture favors in terms of academic success? Do you think digital environments favor one personality type over another, or can we change our learning style to adapt to the digital world? What types of learners do you work best with in an online setting, such as group members that you would be drawn to, and what types of learners challenge you?